Searching the Scriptures with Watchman Alexander, Episode 13. Is everybody in the world going to die before someone finds the answer? Do I have to remind you that theory is the beginning of solution? What are we up against? Is it a dangerous thing? All I've ever known to be true is a lie. I didn't say it would be easy. I just said it would be the truth. I believe this is going to be our finest hour. Welcome to Searching the Scriptures with Watchman Alexander where we break away from religious systems and man-made dogma to learn the Word of God from an independent Hebraic perspective. And now your host, the prophecy buff who tackles the tough stuff, Alexander Lawrence. Hello and shalom. The hour is late, the time is short, and the storm is coming. So this is your opportunity for a systems check. I'm here to wake up the sleeping servants of Yahweh God and equip them for the last days. I do that by teaching discernment, pouring over prophecies, treating the infection of mystery Babylon in the church, and giving you courage. My book is Leviathan's Ruse, the comprehensive guide to the battle between good and evil. My website is watchmanalexander.com. Boy, do I have a crazy show for you tonight. I'm not going to be interviewing Todd Bennett, like I said last time. Unfortunately, for unforeseen reasons, he was not able to join me this week. But next week, we are going to get together. He'll be in Israel. And uh, he supposedly will have a good internet connection there. So we're going to go ahead and do the recording Monday or Tuesday, and I'll have that to you by Friday. Hopefully, the internet speed there will be fast enough because we will be halfway around the world from each other. Uh, But he says it's pretty good from where he lives over there. So I'm trusting that. And uh, God willing, we're going to have his interview next Friday. In the meantime, I wasn't sure exactly what I was going to talk about this week until God dropped something in my lap. And this happened because I was reaching out to a radio show about being a guest on their program. And I noticed one of their latest shows was about a dream that a teenage boy, 16 year old boy had had about the tribulation period or about the end times. It really, the dream starts before the tribulation period in terms of the biblical definition of that. It's It's spanning a time of more than the three and a half years that Yeshua called the Great Tribulation. Nonetheless, the whole time frame of his dream is the last days when it gets really bad. So a a time of global calamity. This recording blew me away. I was just shocked to hear it because of the authenticity, because it was captured in the moment. And this young man is full of emotion about what he's seeing. He's not a believer. Well, he is now. (laughs) He is now. Um, He repented. He came to believe in Yeshua as a result of this. But before having this dream, he had exposure to Christianity, but he did not believe. And during this recording, he actually says, you know, I, I can't believe I never trusted God. I never really believed this stuff. Well, he does now. You know, God is sovereign, and just like he gave a dream to unbelieving Nebuchadnezzar, he gave a dream to this unbelieving kid, and he's done it with others, too. There's a section toward the end of my book where I talk about a man named David Jones who had a vision of the um, the day of the Lord when he was a teenager as well, and he had no relationship with the Lord at all at that point. So Elohim does sometimes give dreams and visions to the lost. What I've done here is taken 12 clips from the recording, which is over an hour long. These are short clips that are going to um, highlight the most important parts of the recording. And if you want to hear the rest of it, please go to a minute to midnight.com. A minute to midnight.com. They are the ones who received this recording and did a show about it, broadcast it. And so credit is due to them. I'm just doing a little bit of my own commentary on these uh, short sections. I believe that they did not release the name of the young man, so I'm just going to call him Joe. And just so you know the context of what was happening here, Joe 
got this vision when he was at home and his uh, mother didn't know what to do with him because of his, of course, you know, strong reaction to this. So she brought him to his uncle's house. His uncle is a, a strong believer who understands in times things. And he was able to sit with him. And one of the interesting things about this is that his uncle had never recorded something on his phone before, but something prompted him. You know, of course, the spirit prompted him to take out his phone and start recording. So in this clip, you're going to hear the uncle and Joe talking while the boy is still seeing the vision. Please do not let children listen to this. If you have teenagers that you think may benefit from it, then you might want to let them listen to it. But this is not for young children. Uh, this is a very difficult recording to hear. And the topics we're going to be talking about are extremely serious. I even recommend that you pray before listening to the rest of this. Get yourself in a good headspace and understand that, uh, well, we're going to talk about the ramifications. We're going to talk about how we should respond to these things. So I'll leave that until later. But just make sure you're in a good headspace before you start this. Uh, but it is so important that we don't bury our heads in the sand and that we do understand what we're up against here in the not too distant future uh, so that we can prepare for it so that we can be most of all spiritually ready for it. Uh, so without further ado, here's the first clip. Just staring at the clock. You were just staring at the clock? Okay. And what happened? As soon as it went to 12. Say that again? As soon as it went to 12. Uh huh. I started seeing a lot of like. <laughs> horrible things. People, what they did to each other to survive. I saw a lot of fire, a lot of blood. A lot. Not dried blood, but a lot of crimson blood. Okay. <laughs> you were wide awake. Yes. It all hit me all of a sudden. People are crazy. Average people just... What you would think would be someone average would just come in. They, they're crazy. They're... They'd like start committing cannibalism <laughs> and they would like offer to, they'd make human offerings to. <laughs> it's okay, buddy. <laughs> You good. <laughs> how, how long did you saw that for? I'm still seeing it. <laughs> I'm still seeing it. Okay, you're good. Could you hear the authenticity in that? This young man was really going through this. He is not an actor. This was not some show that was put on him, and you can tell that this was really happening to this kid. And of course, that shouldn't surprise us because the word says that in the last days, God would pour out his spirit on all kinds of flesh and that our sons and daughters would prophesy with dreams and visions. And yet, when we actually hear one being recorded in real time, it's uh, pretty awesome and unsettling at the same time. The vision began when the clock struck 12. And to me, this says... The dream is about the end. It's about reaching the end of the age, just like that hour hand and minute hand reach the end of their journey around the clock when they hit 12. That's the point of everything resetting. Joe said that he saw blood everywhere and that he saw average people go crazy and even turn to cannibalism. The scriptures do tell us that people will become rabid in the end and band together in tribes. There have been times in history when people have turned to cannibalism. I mean, it happens in remote places even today, but there have been times of great famine or siege against cities, including Jerusalem, when people turned to cannibalism. You know, when Babylon came against Jerusalem and the city was sieged, 
a lot of the people ended up eventually eating other people, even their own children. Even women were eating their newborns and eating the the placenta, the, the afterbirth, um, in order to survive. And that's terrible. But the word of God warned them that that's what would happen. There are prophecies uh, that were given through the prophets at the time to the people of Israel, well, Judah, rather, that said that if you do not turn back, so it's not like they didn't have warning of what was going to happen to them. But he said, if you don't turn back, you're going to end up eating one another because you will be starving to death because your sins will have caught up with you. Let's go ahead and listen to clip number two. And the things I see, the things I still am seeing, it's so horrible. I don't understand why how a man, a woman, kids could do such horrors. How could what was simple living could so in such a little time turn into such horrors? Joe says that in such a short time, people go from simple living to doing horrors. What causes this? Something has to happen or a string of events very quickly has to go off like dominoes in order to take us from life as we know it now. And yes, there's an increasing amount of calamity. There's uh, ethnic tensions. There are people in certain countries who are already in a really bad situation because of socialism or natural disaster. And in those places, uh, things have devolved pretty quickly. But it seems like he's saying on a worldwide scale, we're going to see things, the floor drop out from underneath us. And I think that that's probably the result of one of two things, either the start of a nuclear conflict or a string of terrible natural disasters, or maybe a combination of natural disasters and war. But it would all have to happen pretty quickly, according to what Joe is saying. Let's go to clip number three. And there's going to be something worse after the war. There's not going to be anyone that's going to win. People will claim victory, but it's not going to be victory. It's not going to be for fighting for good or bad. It's just going to be killing just to kill. People are just going to start killing to kill, not even to survive. They're just going to kill for the satisfaction of killing like a sport. So in that clip, he said the war, the war. I think that's really important because I've been telling people we're in for a third world war. President George Washington actually had a vision in which he was told by an angel that the third world war would be the greatest and the last. Men like Henry Groover have gotten visions of another world war. And if you've been following my work, you know that I go to the books of Revelation and Daniel primarily to show that we are to expect another global war, the worst one of all, and that a quarter of the population is going to die off as a result of that war. And then there's further wars past that of a supernatural nature. And so no wonder people end up, as Joe said, uh, killing just to kill. They get desensitized to killing. Uh, Because of all the war, death and destruction just becomes normal to them. It's a terrible thing to think about, but it is what would happen. Let's go now to clip number four. And yet we pretend to know everything. We pretend that we got things figured out. But men's, uh, men don't have a clue of anything. Oh, no, they don't have a clue at all. We're going to make an advancement. That's not going to be good either with the nukes. Uh, uh, it's going to be a, a run for good for power of nukes. They're going to run for TC was the biggest and baddest weapon. They're going to be running for the nukes. So, so Joe says that the nations are going to rush to get bigger and badder nukes. This confirms for us there's going to be a nuclear holocaust. I'm a prepper. I'm not way over the top with it because I can't. I just don't have the resources or the space for that. But 
I am a prepper and I have a lot of supplies, but one thing I don't have yet are radiation pills and Geiger counters. I don't have stuff to protect me from the effects of nuclear fallout. But after listening to this recording, I think I'm going to have to put that on the fast track. This should also tell us that we need to get away from big cities and big military bases. Anywhere that is either highly populated or very strategic is a place that could potentially get nuked. So move away from those places if you possibly can. I'm on the very outskirts of the Austin area, and even that makes me nervous. But if I have to, I can I can run to the east very quickly. There's nothing else beside where we live other than farmland. Chances are I can probably get away from it if I need to. I have friends that are living in big cities on the East Coast. I know people who are living in cities in Florida. Guys, those are huge targets. Even Denver is a huge target in Cheyenne Mountain. Um, there are bases in Nevada. There are places that are remote and yet still would be a target. So be aware of where you are. And honestly, now is the time, if you haven't already, to get away from places like that. Forget about your job. Your job's not important. It's not. You can get another job. You can do something else. You want to get your family to a safe place and do it now. And with whatever time we have left, you can put down some roots, you can make preparations, and you can make, start making connections with your neighbors in your new home because all of that stuff is going to be essential. All right, let's listen to our fifth clip. You Beware see, the Catholic. Huh? Beware the Catholics. Beware of the Catholics? Why? The first word will come from them. Oh, wow. What do you mean by that, puppy? <laughs> the first word of war will come from them. Okay. <laughs> they will claim it's peace. <laughs> but it's just corruption. I know. <laughs> You're fine. Oh. oh my gosh, puppy. <laughs> it's all corruption. Beware the Catholics, he says. The first word of war will be from them. From the Vatican, no doubt. Are the Catholics going to start another holy war? I don't know. This is one that confuses me a little bit. I didn't think that the Catholic Church would be the one to start a world war. I thought certainly they would be involved in the long-term effects of that, but are they going to actually start a holy war? I have one theory about this. I think that Pope Francis is going to get assassinated. You know, he has said that he doesn't think he's going to be around for very long. He And it seemed to be a little bit morbid when he said that. He seemed to think that something was going to happen to him. You know, there are some people that are after him. Uh, the Muslims, for sure, would like to take him out. But there are also people within Italy who would like to get rid of him. There was a Catholic priest named Malachi who made a prophecy about the popes, the succession of the popes. And I don't know if he got this from Yahweh or if he got this from some unclean spirit. But either way, it seems to be pretty reliable so far. The succession has held true to the prophecy. And the thing is... Francis is the last one. We're on the last pope in the prophecy of Malachi. If that prophecy is valid and Francis is the last one, and if Francis is right and he's not around for very long, what does that mean? If he gets taken out, especially by Muslims, I can see the Catholic Church really pushing for another holy war. Joe also says they claim it's for peace, but it's for corruption. Honestly, I don't understand what that means. I'm going to have to chew on that for a little while. Um, if anybody has any bright ideas about that one, please email me or comment on my Facebook posts or something because I would like to know what you guys think that means. Okay, let's go to clip number six. Oh, but listen to me, baby. It's all true. It's oh. all true, yes. I've always doubted. I've always doubted my whole life. Oh. 
the reality of this has really set in for Joe. And he's stricken by the fact that he's been a doubter. And man, the the emotion here is just raw. But I don't want this to be you in the future. If you're on the fence right now, if you have been one of these people that doubts that things are going to get bad, because of course, people have been declaring that calamity is coming, that the, um, you know, SHTF and Teowaki, the end of the world as we know it, and all of these uh, ideas have been circulating for a while. And so people get a little bit desensitized. They get numb to them. But the fact is, the Bible is true and things will eventually go bad. And so if you're one of these people that thinks maybe there's nothing to all of this, uh, you're going to reach a point at which you say, like Joe does, it's all true. It's all true. And I doubted. And how could I? Now, he's talking about his belief in God, which is not the case for most or all of my listeners. But likewise, we can doubt that his word, certain parts of his word are true. And that can get us in trouble because we don't take action on those things. So I want you to be the type of person that takes action, that gets ready, and that is not caught off guard. Don't be a person that says, oh, man, I can't believe I was rejecting it all. I can't believe that I was disbelieving. And now finally, here it is, and I'm not ready for it. All right, let's go to clip seven. Do you see why we're making backpacks, emergency backpacks, and how we're getting things done so we're we can We're going to need be- a lot more than just food. I know, Papi, but we can only do what we can do. Remember. So we're packing up food, we're gathering the things that we need. Because, see, remember, the only thing that matters here is for you to be right with God. We just heard some wisdom from Joe's uncle there saying, you know, they have been doing some preparations. But the really important part is the number one key is be right with God. Make sure that you are close to him, that he listens to you. Remember There are certain characters in the Bible that God actually said about them. When they talk to me, I listen. I hear them. Why? Because they were people after his heart, because they conformed to him. They were obedient to him um, and they loved him. And because of that, God rescued them. God was there for them in times of great need. Now, not everybody got rescued forever (laughs) until the end of their life. God rescued the apostles out of many situations, but eventually they got martyred. But that was for God's glory. There was a point in that. There was um, growth of the church that happened from that. But in many, many situations throughout the life of a believer who is uh, truly obedient, God is going to be there to get you out, is to rescue you and and to let you have time to be effective for the kingdom of God in this world. Let's go on to clip eight. You still seeing anything? What do you see? More that. More that. They're going after the churches. Not just the churches, they're going for after people that believe in God. They're going to slaughter them Mm -hmm. just slowly and painfully. They're going to prolong their deaths. To the fullest extent. And there's a man watching and smiling while it all happens. And there's another man right next to him that's shorter. (laughs) They're both shadows. They're both shadows. They're watching it all happen. Is there any anybody that you recognize from the from this earth that you can name? Okay. I would never thought that we were gonna have this amazing experience, man. This is really I know it's tough, but it's really amazing things. Well, this one was not easy to hear. Trust me, I do not like thinking about this. I know none of you does either. Unfortunately, We know from the book of Revelation that many will be beheaded for their faith in the last three and a half years, the great tribulation period. 
there's very likely going to be torture involved before some of that beheading. This is not unusual in the history of the Bride of Christ. I know we don't like to think about this, but many, many people were killed by Rome and then by the Roman Catholic Church for their beliefs, for not wavering from what the scripture says, for standing firm on biblical faith. Did you know that the Catholic Church killed hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of people who kept the Sabbath just because they kept the Sabbath and they kept the feasts and they didn't want to participate in the things that the Roman Catholic Church had come up with that they derived from the pagan religious practices of that time? Many, many Protestants were killed. And I mean Protestants even before the official Protestant Reformation. Going hundreds of years back, there were Protestants within the uh, the realm of the Roman Catholic Church who were slaughtered for what they believed. And before that, the Roman Caesars were having us killed. People were thrown to the lions. People were impaled and set on fire. People were killed on the rack. I mean, there was all sorts of terrible terrible things that they were doing. And those believers, they planted seeds with their blood. They glorified God. They showed that the testimony of Yeshua is greater than any other consideration, even the pain of torture and death. And I would like to think that if I came up against that kind of a scenario today, that I likewise would stand firm, would not recant, but would lay down my life willingly as Yeshua did for the greater purpose. We need to steal ourselves now for that. We need to think through, genuinely, deeply think through, what would I do if I was confronted with a choice of either being tortured and killed or going against what the Bible teaches, going against the things that I know are true? What would I do? Am I going to be like the heroes of the faith? who died a martyr's death and have been given a martyr's reward in the eternal afterlife? Or am I going to be a coward? Do we really want to do that? Do we really want to love our lives like that instead of loving God supremely, instead of sacrificing everything like our Lord did? He's our model. Let's do that. Okay, let's go on to number nine. The volcanoes, a lot of them, are going to erupt the ring of fire. Because I see a deformed circle goes from Japan to like California, whole area. Mm -hmm. All that's going to erupt. And then from there, there's going to be new land formation, but it's not it's not land, it's, it's, it's lava that's been molten. There's going to be so much of it. So much lava is going to be pouring out. <clears throat> You've seen a lot, Buffy. People are going to die a lot and they're going to, be sacrificing humans and animals to it. And it's not going to make it better. It's going to drive people insane. And then they'll just accept it and start going crazy like I was looking earlier. Joe used a term in this last clip, the ring of fire. Evidently, he didn't actually know what that was. He used the terminology because it was given to him in his vision but he had never heard the ring of fire, according to his uncle. And all these volcanoes are going to go off ostensibly at the same time. It's going to be so bad that people are going to turn to sacrificing things to the gods to try and appease the spirits or to try and calm the earth goddess or something like that. Imagine what all of those volcanoes going off at once is going to do to the environment, especially in combination with nuclear warfare. It's going to cause an incredible change in our atmosphere and block out a lot of sunlight and really is going to change the environment for the worse. Okay, let's go on to number 10. People are going to keep getting crazier and start going for the sane. And from there, loot them, kill them, make tribes. 
and they're all savages. Ruled by no rule. There's no rules. <laughs> they're gonna be tearing up animals alive and eat them from there. I'm seeing it. Goats. Sheep. Cats. Dogs. Cows. They're not gonna hurt them. They're just gonna straight up see. They see it. It's food. It's alive. It's moving. It's food. It won't matter what it is. Cannibalism will be common. It won't be something weird for them. If they need to resort to it, they'll just go. They'll just go and do it. Ugh. America's not gonna have it good. America is gonna be mainly made out of savages. And Asia's gonna like all that whole area. They're gonna be hell worshippers of some sort. They're gonna be worshiping something, but it's not God. You mean in Asia? The whole area. Chinese, Asia, Japanese, they're going to be worshipping to their to their own gods. Mm -hmm. But they're not like hieroglyphic. They're going to be like real. They look real as if they were right there. <laughs> and they're not going to have their skin. It's different colors. It's going to look it's like their statues only come to life <laughs> some of them are small some of them are human size and some of them are giants that's all <sighs> that's all after most of the world's big governments have been brought to their knees by nuclear warfare uh, people are going to band together in tribes this is going to be a tribal environment again and there's not going to be any rules. The rule of law will have become void because who's going to enforce it? People are going to eat animals alive. People are evidently going to lose the ability to sympathize and put themselves in the shoes of another being. They're going to eat things alive. They're not even going to, maybe they, there's just a, a lack of resources to be able to cook things, or maybe they're so hungry that they just don't want to take the time and they just will eat something as soon as it's available, even if it's still living. Uh, maybe it's just cruelty. I don't know. He doesn't explain any of that. What I do know is that there's going to be an incredible a famine that occurs as a result of World War and all of the changes to the environment. That's what the third horseman of the apocalypse is all about. It's about terrible famine and the cost of food will be so high. No one's going to be able to afford it. And there's going to be some places which are probably cut off so that they can't even get resources in. You know, merchants won't be moving wares easily like they do now. And in those places where you're isolated, it's going to be dog eat dog. Literally, you know, cannibalism, he says, is going to be common. America is going to be full of savagery. Meanwhile, in East Asia, they're going to be worshiping these deities that have somehow come to life, like statues come to life. Some of them will be normal size. Some of them will be giant, he says. I'm not exactly sure what to make of that part. I guess I have two theories. One is robotics. Um, it could be an animated statue of a deity that these people end up worshiping, uh, much like the image of the beast that's put up in the temple um, after he betrays the Jewish people. That image will be animated and will have the ability to kill people. And it, people are supposed to worship it as an idol. I can only imagine that that has to do with robotics and technological weaponry. Maybe the same thing is going to happen in East Asia where they make robots in the shape of their gods. The other possibility is these could actually be spirits that have manifested or they could be something that has come up out of the earth. Um, there are a lot of theories circulating out there in regards to everything from UFO phenomenon to 
the hollow earth and uh, ancient Nephilim and such still being alive. There are things um, in there's something in Daniel that seems to indicate that uh, some other kind of being will mix their seed with ours, but not through copulation. Uh, this could go in a number of directions, and I'm not going to get into all of that now. I'm going to write about some of it in the next volume of Leviathan's Ruse. But um, suffice to say, stuff's going to be real weird over there. Let's go to number 11. You see anything for America that you can remember? Savagery. And chaos. It's just savagery and chaos. There's not going to be no worshipping here. It's all going to be based on materialism. What we can have, what we can hold, and how can we can survive. And over there, they're going to mainly rely on their gods. I don't have much to add to this. I just wanted to let my uh, my fellow countrymen hear about what's going to happen to America again. He said it once before, but again, we're going to fall into a kind of savage survivalism. Polytheism is not really going to be an issue here, but everything will be about survival. This next clip is the last one, number 12. When it happens, it's all going to happen at once. Like, event after event, from what I saw. Mm-hmm. It's not going to happen one thing first and then. It's all going to happen. It's just going to get worse and get worse. Or... It's all going to happen at once, he says. Now, what I think that he means by this is not that everything is going to happen simultaneously. That doesn't make any sense. But we're really going to take a nosedive within a short span of time. Things are going to happen in rapid succession. There's not going to be a lot of space. Once the chaos really kicks off, it's going to accelerate downhill very fast. Those clips were incredible, weren't they? Man. There's a lot to digest. What do we say about all of that? How do we even really begin to fathom until we're going through it? It's just so difficult to imagine the extents of the suffering that we're going to witness. I don't want to leave you with just that. I don't want you to feel despondent or fall into hopelessness. I actually just wrote a blog post about how Christians should emotionally deal with tragedy. You can go read that on my website if you would like, but the short version of it is, don't let your hearts be troubled. Hang on to the joy and peace that we've been given in the Lord and keep your eyes on the prize. By keeping our eyes on what we know is coming after this life, we keep everything in perspective. This whole life is totally transient and brief it's all over in the blink of an eye compared to eternity. And there are so many amazing rewards awaiting us. The Apostle Paul said no one has even imagined how great the stuff that is coming for those who believe is going to be. We can't even fathom the awesomeness of what God has prepared for those who love and serve him. So when we think about our lives from that perspective, we realize that the light and momentary suffering of this life is all worth it. Yeshua said that the world was going to hate his disciples because it hated him first. And he told them, you are going to come under tribulation. He didn't say you might. He said, you will have tribulation in this world. And so we need to expect that as members of his kingdom. You know, if we serve sin, we have to pay the penalty of sin, which is terrible. But if we serve God, we have to go through suffering for the glory of God and for the refining of our souls. Either way, there's suffering. You're not getting away from it. Either way, life is difficult right now. But our hope, our blessed hope, is that after the momentary suffering of this life, that we get to enter into eternal glory. We get to enter into complete peace and happiness, bliss forever and ever. And so knowing that, man, we can go through anything. We can survive any calamity. We can have joy and peace in the midst of all kinds of trial 
because we know that we're secure in his arms on that day. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we ought to minimize the effect of tragedy that happens around us. It's okay to feel pain and loss and to mourn. In fact, that's healthy. We need to do those things, but we don't stay in that place. Once we've mourned, once we've processed, uh, we give it over to God. And even in that process of mourning, we keep hold of our peace. We know that it's all going to be okay in the end. We still feel the pain. We still allow ourselves to some extent to be to be devastated and yet not completely overwhelmed to the point of hopelessness. Hold it right there, watchman. Get a cup of tea. It's time for Everything Under the Sun when we take three minutes to hear from the watchman's wife, Amanda Lawrence. In today's episode, I want to discuss the difference between self-care and numbing. I always think that this is an important topic, but we can relate it to what the watchman was just talking about. As we get closer to the end of the age and as things start to get weird, to steal a phrase from Pastor Jonathan, it's going to be very tempting to stick our heads in the sand and try to pretend that it's not real. Now, I can personally relate to this. Uh, shortly after we got married, Alex had this huge interest in eschatology, seemingly out of nowhere, and I was hearing a lot of this okay, all of this for the first time. And I eventually had to ask him to stop telling me because I was scared and I had no context for it. And I was overwhelmed and freaked out. So the other week, Alex and I were in the car and I was reading aloud from C.S. Lewis's The Screwtape Letters. If you're not familiar with it, get familiar and go read it right now. I'll wait. Okay, so you know from your quick read that the Screwtape Letters is a collection of letters written by a demon to his nephew, encouraging him in all of the ways of spiritual warfare to be used against Christians. At one point, Screwtape is telling his nephew to keep the Christian man focused on real life, things that he can see and touch. This diffuses any delving into the spiritual or connecting with God. And as an aside, how well does this work? Right? It's hard to believe or focus in what we believe, people raising from the dead, talking donkeys, angels, demons, when you're sitting down to an NFL game with friends. So anyway, towards the end of the age, I predict that the opposite will be true. I think that the reality will be so unsettling and overwhelming that people will choose to turn to entertainment and numbing to escape the uncertain future, if only for a few minutes. I believe that being mindful, checking your motivations, and having a plan are all good ways to keep away from numbing behavior. First, be mindful and aware. How much time are you spending on your phone apps or playing games or reading? If you get lost in something and look up, astonished by how much time has passed, then it might be wise to reconsider how you're managing time. I'm not going to lie, I'm speaking from experience. The enemy uses entertainment as a distraction from what really matters, so that makes me check my motivations. Usually when I'm numbing out, I'm avoiding an uncomfortable feeling. I might be upset with someone, disappointed in myself, or sad about a troubling story in the news. On the flip side, I can get lost in a book for hours just because I adore reading. So if the time wasn't better allocated toward something else, that would fall under the category of self-care. If I've had a stressful day, sometimes I need to unwind with Netflix for a bit, and that's where having a plan comes in. I have an old school planner, the kind you write in, not the kind that you add in on your phone. And I write and protect free time. I try to schedule chores and other priorities first, but I've learned that when I set aside time for myself and time for self-care, I'm less likely to numb out. If I'm less stressed, then I'll have less of a need to avoid things. If we, and I really do include myself in this as well, if we start practicing these principles now when things are stable, it may be easier to manage stress moving forward. So my time is just about up. So this is actually part one of two. So I'll be talking about this next week. But I also wanted to throw in, I'm saying entertainment because I see that commonly, right? There's, there's Netflix, there's TV, there's the phones, but this can also be alcohol or pornography or shopping or working too hard. It's anything that is taking up a vast amount of time that you're doing mostly when you're stressed. So uh, I hope that gives a little bit of clarity or conviction if you're sitting there thinking, but I don't have a smartphone or I never watch Netflix. Anyway, I'd love to hear your feedback. 
as long as it's positive. So feel free to uh, send me an email at the watchman's wife at gmail.com. Thanks for the break and for the wisdom, Amanda. That gave me enough time to have a cup of mountain tea with lemon balm and caraway. Now let's keep going. Let me be transparent with you for a minute and let you know that sometimes I just sit and mourn and I sit and and weep. Um, Even if I'm not crying, which sometimes I have, uh, most of the time I don't. But there's a groaning that happens in my heart and uh, and a groaning in my prayers about what the world is going to go through, about uh, the tragedy that's going to befall people. You know, I've seen things and I've read things that make me absolutely convinced. Uh, and th- this recording that I shared with you today is just one more of those things. But I'm absolutely convinced that what is coming upon the world is a very difficult time. And I mourn about that because it's not lovely. It's not going to be uh, a good thing for anyone. And You know, there's a lot of innocent people that will get caught up in this as well as look, I don't want to see anyone suffer innocent or not. God says he takes no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked and neither do I. And so I don't want to see what's coming. It's a necessary part of the story, but I'm not looking forward to it. I think you'd be crazy to be looking forward to it. Sometimes I hear preppers talk as if they actually do look forward to a system collapse of some sort. And that's just crazy talk. But I think it's actually a good thing to mourn about what's coming upon the world. And I find support for this in scripture. Go to Ezekiel chapter 9 and you'll read about how before the destruction of Jerusalem, Ezekiel was given a vision of one of the heavenly beings tasked to go down and mark the foreheads in the spiritual, of course, not physically, but spiritually mark the foreheads of all the people who were mourning over sin, who were lamenting iniquity, who were saddened by the perversions that were taking place throughout the land of Judah. And those people were spared from death by the invaders. Um, The invaders, of course, didn't see the seal. They didn't know that certain people were marked. But what was going on in the supernatural realm is that some people who were marked because of their Uh, the right tilt of their heart, the correct slant of their character towards godliness instead of towards wickedness, those people were supernaturally protected. The enemy was prevented from harming them. Now, I'm sure it was still a very difficult time for them to go through. I mean, they were in the same city that was under siege and they were probably starving. They were probably suffering in a lot of ways with everybody else, but their lives were spared because they did not like what was going on. They agreed with God that, yes, what's happening here is perversion. And so in the same way, we today need to lament the situation. We need to be very downcast at the fact that so much sin is embraced in our nation and in our world today. I say our nation as if everyone listening to this is an American. I apologize. In my nation, in whatever nation you're in, especially if you're in a a first world English speaking country, uh, there are problems. And so we need to be aware of them and to regret these things on behalf of our country. And if that's truly how we feel about things, then God sees that and he sends his angels to mark us so that the things that happen in the end won't overtake us. From what I see in scripture, there are certain groups of people that are going to be more protected than others in the last days. But that's kind of its own study. That's a whole thing that I need to uh, to really clarify before I break it out. So I'm going to save that for another time. Now it's your turn to direct the conversation. It's listener Q&A. Today's listener question actually comes from Amanda Lawrence. She's asking, why did so many of the kingdoms in the Near East war against Israel after hearing about the miracles that Yahweh frequently performed on their behalf? The Assyrian army got decimated when it came against Judah. So why did Nebuchadnezzar think that he could overtake Jerusalem when the Assyrians had failed so utterly? It's a good question. 
Many of the nations in the promised land were not foolish enough to try and war against the Israelites. There were a number of them that surrendered. And in fact, Yahweh required the Israelites to offer terms of surrender to the cities and strongholds in the promised land before attacking them, with the exception of the Rephaim tribes. The Rephaim tribes, the ones descended from the Nephilim, um, they were to be annihilated, but the others had to be offered terms of surrender. And some of them took those terms. Those that did decide to fight against Israel did so because of their polytheistic worldview. Almost everyone believed at that time, as far as I can tell, that their Elohim, little e, Elohim, their gods, would overpower the Hebrew Elohim, big E. Of course, in Hebrew, there's not a lowercase or uppercase, but the way that we write it now, big E Elohim is the most high God. Little E Elohim is just the gods or the immortals that are ruling over the nations. And the ancient Goyim knew that there were powerful spirits that were leading them. And so they were willing to pit their national gods against Israel's national God, especially the big civilizations, great civilizations like Assyria, Egypt, and Babylon attributed their greatness to the spiritual principalities that they were serving. The gods of these really powerful nations were believed to be the most powerful gods. It makes sense. And this wasn't all just a flight of fancy on their part. You know, at Babel, Yahweh gave the, the nations of men over to the 70 rebellious members of the divine council, the immortals, the sons of God, these Elohim. They were really and truly and still are ruling over the nations. Ancient texts that talk about the religious practices and ceremonies of polytheistic cultures indicate that the people really believe that their gods, these spirits, would show up at special times and under special circumstances, like if they had a, a large worship gathering and there were sacrifices, and if they did things the right way, and especially if they did it on the right days of the year, um, the gods would show up. They knew, they knew that there were spirits in control, and they knew that they had power. And so they depended on those spirits, their gods, to overcome the spirits of the nations that they wanted to war against. Remember Balaam, the prophet that uh, was asked to curse Israel? He wasn't a Hebrew prophet. He was a diviner who was very well known at the time for being able to contact the gods and convince them to do things. Both he and the king who hired him thought that Yahweh was just another one of the many gods over the nations. They didn't recognize that they were dealing with the most high God. If they had known that they were dealing with the creator God, do you really think that they would have tried to call him up and convince him to curse Israel or to change his mind about Israel? They didn't understand that Yahweh is qualitatively different from the other Elohim. Neither did Nebuchadnezzar. So when Nebuchadnezzar successfully invaded Judea and took over Jerusalem, he firmly believed that it was because his god, Marduk, was greater than Yahweh. He didn't realize that Yahweh had allowed Judah to be overcome because of their sins. And Nebuchadnezzar was humbled. It took quite a while, but he was humbled big time on several occasions before he finally understood that the Jewish God is the maker of all gods and kingdoms and that his success conquering Jerusalem had nothing to do with him or Marduk. If you'd like to have Watchman Alexander answer your question in a future episode, please send an email to questions at watchmanalexander.com with your city and state or region in the subject line. That's about it for today's podcast, but I want to let you know that there is a resources page on my website. So if after talking about what's coming upon the world and preparation today, you want to start to order some things, some survival supplies and things that are going to help your family in the long term, then please go to my resources page and look at what I've got there. And it's certainly not comprehensive. There's a number of what I would consider to be the more important products on there that you're going to want to get first and foremost. But there's certainly many other things that you're going to need to procure um, but that's a good place to start. It also helps me because there are affiliate links. So anything you order through those links, I get kickbacks for that. That's not why I'm 
telling you to get these things. Okay, I hope you understand that I am looking out for everyone's well-being and I am trying to do what's right. I'm not out to make a buck. Okay, the money is not going to matter pretty soon. It's all going to be worthless anyway. But uh, right now, I still have to feed my family and it is nice to have a little bit of an affiliate income. So please consider using those links as opposed to going and finding it on your own. I always recommend things that I know work, things that I have used and benefited from. So if you order these things, you're assured uh, that you're getting quality products. If If you've been blessed by this podcast, I ask you to please rate it on iTunes or whatever other platform you use. Those rankings help other people to find the podcast. That's all for episode 13. So until next time, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Watchmen out.